In this video, we're going to go for a worked example of how to calculate the forces in an indeterminate truss. We reviewed the concepts in the previous video, but now we're going to actually go through all of the analysis steps required. So, reminding ourselves, on the left-hand side, we had an actual structure that had four joints. We had two members overlapping but not connected by a joint in the center. So BD and CA are overlapping but not connected. And we have a seven kilonewton applied load. We cannot use statics to solve this problem. So we're going to reduce this problem to two statically determinate problems that we can solve. First of all, we have a primary structure where we've removed the member AC and we have then a redundant structure where we're going to try to find out the force FAC using the concept of compatibility. So first of all, what we need to do is analyze our primary structure. And for many of you, this will just be a revision of statics, but for the purpose of completeness, we're going to analyze the entire structure. So the primary structure, let's quickly draw a free body diagram of the entire structure that we've got. We have the applied seven kilonewton load. We have RCX and RCY at joint C and we only have a horizontal reaction RDY at joint D and let's label up our joints so we have D, C, B and A. So the first thing that we need to do is find these unknown reaction forces. So if I take moments about point C, I get rid of RCY and RCX straight away. And so taking moments about C, I have the seven kilonewton applied load multiplied by the lever arm. Let's just remember our dimension. So we have three meters and four meters. So seven kilonewtons multiplied by four meters. And that is going in a clockwise direction. So I'm gonna consider that to be negative. And then I have R D Y multiplied by a lever arm of three meters. And that's going in an anti-clockwise direction around C. So I'm presuming that to be positive. And then there are no other forces on the system. So that must be equal to zero for equilibrium. And therefore we can calculate with, this is R D X, not R D Y. We can calculate that R D X is equal to 9.33 kilonewtons. And we can go on to consider the sum of the forces in the X direction. So X and Y for completeness. So some of the forces in the X direction must be equal to naught. So we have RCX plus RDX is equal to zero. And we know RDX is 9.33 kilonewtons pointing to the right. Therefore, RCX equals minus 9.33 kilonewtons, i.e. minus meaning that our assumed direction for the reaction was wrong and therefore is actually pointing to the left. And finally, we have the third equation of equilibrium. So sum of the forces in the y direction, I have RCY pointing upwards and a seven kilonewton applied load pointing downwards must be equal to zero for equilibrium. And therefore RCY is equal to seven 
kilonewtons and pointing upwards. Now that we have our reactions from the considering equilibrium of the entire structure, we now move on to consider method of joints for each of the individual joints in the structure. So, so let's draw the free body diagram of joint A. So we have, reminding ourselves what the structure looks like, we have a force in AB and we have a force in AD and the seven kilonewtons applied. So we have vertical force NAB we have a horizontal force, NAD, and we have the applied load of 7 kilonewtons, which we already know is pointing downwards. Both of the internal forces are pulling away from the joint, and therefore we're assuming that we have tension. So, first of all, looking at the sum of the forces in the y direction we have n a b minus seven kilonewtons equals to zero and therefore the force in member a b so n a b is equal to seven kilonewtons looking at the forces in the x direction now we have N, A, D, no other forces on there, but must be equal to zero for equilibrium. So we have a zero force member in the structure. We're now going to move on to the free body diagram of joint C. The free body diagram of joint C now. We have the force NBC, we have NCD, we have the vertical reaction RCY and the vertical reaction RCX. And Examining the sum of the forces in the x direction now, we have, just reminding ourselves first of all before we move on to that, that RCY was equal to 7 kilonewtons and RCX was equal to minus 9.33 kilonewtons. So returning to the sum of the forces in the x direction, now we have NBC pointing to the right, minus 9.33, which pointing to the right, but we know it has a negative sign, so pointing to the left, must be equal to zero for equilibrium. And therefore, NBC is equal to 9.33 kilonewtons. Now we're going to examine the sum of the forces in the y direction. So we have RCY minus NCD is equal to 0. And we know that RCY was already equal to 7. And therefore, that gets us that NCD equals 7 kilonewtons. And finally, we can look at the free body diagram of joint B. So, 
This is the top right hand corner, so reminding ourselves we have N, B, C, N, B, A, or N, A, B, and N, B, D, and finally we need to remember that we have three and four for our directions, for our cosines and sines. So having a look at the sum of the forces in the y direction, first of all. So sum of the forces in the y direction, we have NBA pointing downwards and N B D also pointing downwards and we need the sine which is 3 over 5 must be equal to 0 and we now remind ourselves that N B A was actually equal to 7 kilonewtons and therefore we can rearrange the equation and find that N B D is equal to minus 11.67 kilonewtons. So it's actually going to be in compression. So it's worth putting a C in brackets to denote that that's compression. So at this moment in time, we know all of the forces for the real structure. Let's remind ourselves or not the real structure, but the primary structure. So this is the real structure minus the member AC that we've removed. But now we know all of the forces, the internal forces and the reactions which we needed to get to there. So with all of these forces considered, we can now consider the redundant structure. So let's remind ourselves what we have as a redundant structure. So we have exactly the same geometry as the primary structure. We have exactly the same support conditions. So at C we had a pin support and at D we had a vertical roller support so exactly the same dimension so we have three meters and we have four meters and to get the flexibility coefficient we want to find out what the deflection would be between A and C as a result of applying a unit load. So we have a unit load at C going in the direction towards A and a unit load at, at A going towards C. And we'll find out what the deflection of this truss would be due, due to this. So first of all, what we're going to do is find out what the forces would be in this truss. So as with any other truss problem, we need to draw the free body diagram of the entire structure. So I'm replacing the supports with the reactions and I'm gonna use a little r, cx for this unit load scenario, a little r, c, y for the vertical load at c, and a little r, c, R D X for the reaction at D. And now we're going to use the equations of equilibrium to find out these reaction forces before we go on to find out the before we go on to find out the internal forces in the bars themselves. So first thing we're going to do is take moments 
about point C. Now I've chosen this pretty much on purpose because the unit load at C and the unit load at A go straight through this joint C and therefore have no lever arm by taking moments at C. So by taking moments at C, my equilibrium equation becomes R D X multiplied by the lever arm of three meters must be equal to zero because there are no other forces that don't go straight through the point C itself. And therefore, that we find out that the reaction R, little r dx must be equal to zero. So now we're going to consider horizontal equilibrium. So some, some of the forces in the x direction, we can see that the horizontal component of the unit load at C must be equal to the horizontal component of the unit load at A. And so we can neglect those forces. We know they cancel each other out. But we also have RCX pointing to the right plus RDX pointing to the right must be equal to zero. We've already calculated that RDX was equal to zero. And therefore the reaction RCX is equal to zero. And finally we're going to look at vertical equilibrium. So the same idea again, the unit loads cancel each other out. The vertical components of the unit load cancel each other out. And so we're left with the sum of the forces in the y direction means that RCY must be equal to zero. So all of the reactions are strangely equal to zero for this example. We can now proceed on to the method of joints for each of the joints A, B, C, D, and we'll probably only need three of those. So let's have a look at the method of joints. And I'm going to draw the free body diagram of point A first of all. So joint A. So at joint A, we're going to have an internal force in the bar AB. I'm going to presume it to be tensile, so pulling away from joint A. And I'm going to give that a little n now because it's for the unit load structure rather than the primary structure, that's little n a b. We also have an internal force in the member a d. So I'm going to give that again, the little n to show that it's for the unit load, not for the primary structure. That's n a d. And finally we have some forces. So we have a unit load and the direction signs and cosines for that unit load. And I'm gonna convert that unit load into horizontal and vertical components at joint A. So just remind ourselves that that is A. So converting the unit load into horizontal and vertical components, I have pointing to the left, 0.8, so four-fifths of one, and pointing upwards, I have three-fifths of the unit load, so 0.6. And using the equations of equilibrium, so first of all, some of the, some of the forces in the y direction, I have NAB, plus 0.6 equal to zero, and therefore NAB is equal to minus 0.6. Looking at the sum of the forces in the x direction now, I can see 
So minus n a d pointing to the left, minus 0 0.8 also pointing to the left must be equal to zero, and I can rearrange that, and I get that n a d is equal to minus 0 0.8. So both of them minus going in the opposite direction from what we'd assumed, which is tensile. So both of them compressive. I can now move on to joint C. So I need to draw the free body diagram for joint C. So I have an internal force in member N in member BC, so I'm going to call that little n b c. I have an internal force in member CD, n c d, and I'm drawing both of those pulling away from the joint and therefore showing that we're presuming them to be in tension. Let's move the C just over here. And again, we have the unit load pulling away from joint C. Again, we're presuming it to be in tension. And we're going to convert that into vertical and horizontal components. So I have a vertical component of 0 0.6 and a horizontal component of that unit load of 0 0.8. And applying our equations of equilibrium now, we can show with some of the forces in the x direction. We have NBC plus 0.8 is equal to zero. And therefore, NBC equals minus 0.8. So it's in compression. And now taking the sum of the forces in the y direction, we have minus NCD pointing downwards, minus 0 0.6 also pointing downward is equal to zero. And therefore we get that NCD is equal to minus 0 0.6. So again, in compression. And finally, we can proceed on to joint B. We could use joint D as well for a check. But I'm going to leave that for you guys. So first of all, joint B. And the potential forces on joint B are the internal force NAB. The horizontal in internal force NBC. So remember BC and the member force in member BD, so that's NBD. And again, with the direction cosines and sines, so we have three, four, five. So we write down our equations of equilibrium, so let's have a look at the sum of the forces in the y direction. Could just as easily have taken some of the forces in the x direction. So we have minus NAB minus NBD and we want the vertical component of NBD so that's minus three fifths of NBD must be equal to zero for equilibrium and we can also remind ourselves scrolling back up the page that NAB was minus 0.6 minus 0.6 so we get a minus minus so that becomes a plus 0.6 and we can rearrange this equation then to give us that n b d is equal to five thirds of 0 0.6, which equals one kilonewton.
and it's positive, so we know that that means tension. And at this point now, we have all of the internal forces in the primary structure, and we have all of the internal forces in the redundant structure. So at this point, we want to go back to our equation of compatibility. And we introduced this in a previous video, but we remember if we wanted no deflection between A and C in the actual structure, this meant that the deflection in the primary structure must be cancelled out by the real forces in the redundant, so the real redundant force FAC multiplied by the flexibility FAC AC. So we need to be able to calculate the delta AC and then also the flexibility and then return to this equation so that we can finally calculate the redundant force FAC. Before we can do that, we need some extra information. So if we want to calculate deflections, we need some extra information that we don't need to consider for statically determinate problems. So we're going to choose the material properties and the geometric properties of this. So we're going to choose that each of the truss members has a Young's modulus for steel, which is 200 kilonewtons per millimeter squared. And we're going to choose with the area of all of the truss members is equal to 446 millimeters squared. And as we did for problems just involving deflections, we're going to use a tabular approach to perform our calculations. This makes it very easy to put into a spreadsheet. So the columns for our table will be member. We want the force due to the unit load, the force due to the 7 kilonewton load on the primary structure, not the real structure. We want the length of the members, the area of the members, the Young's modulus of the members, and then the final two columns. First of all, we want to calculate delta AC. And we remember from what we did with deflections of trusses, that we had the sum of N N L divided by a e would give us that deflection especially as the unit load has been placed at the point where we want a deflection and in the direction that we want the deflection finally we're going to calculate our compatibility so this factor fac fac and this is what we would get if we place a unit load at the point where we want to know the deflection as a result of that unit load and in the direction that we would want that direction of the unit load. So that would be the same as having a column of n little n little n l divided by a e. So we can now fill out our table so we have member a, B, and we remember that the force in A, B due to the unit load was minus 0 0.6. The force in the primary structure was 7 kilonewtons. The length of A, B will be 3,000 millimeters. The area will be 446 millimeters squared 
and the Young's modulus is 200 kilonewtons per millimeter squared. And finally, performing the calculation of N times N times L divided by AE gets us minus 0.141. And let's draw some vertical lines on this table. Now AB is done with, sorry, we'll now calculate the NNL divided by A, where we're using the little n's, the unit loads, and we get 0 0.0121. And we're going to move on to AD. And the unit load, we had minus 0 0.8. From the real load, we had zero. And the, mid, the length of this member was 4,000. The area was the same, 446. The Young's modulus was the same of 200. And our little n, capital N, because we have a zero force member in the, redundant, in the primary structure, that will be equal to zero. But in the redundant structure, we had, no port, we had real numbers for little n. So we have 0 0.0287. Moving on to member BC. So we have minus 0 0.8. 9.33. A length of 4,000. An area of 446. Young's modulus of 200. And the summation for the deflection delta AC will be minus 0.335. And the summation for the flexibility coefficient will be 0.287. We can now move on to member BD. And the unit load gave us a unit load in member BD. The real load on the primary structure gave us a force of minus 1.67. We had a length of 5,000. The area remains the same. The Young's modulus is 200. And the summation then for the deflection will give us minus 0 0.654 and the flexibility coefficient the summation little n little n l divided by ae will give us 0 0.0561 and finally we have one member left to go that member is member c d so the little n gave us minus 0 0.6. The 7 kilonewtons gave us 7 kilonewtons in member CD as well. The length of CD is 3,000. The area is 446 millimeters squared. Young's modulus of 200 kilonewtons per millimeter squared. And then the summation will give us minus 0 0.141 and for the flexibility coefficient the summation is 0 0.0121 so finally we can sum the columns the last two columns to give us that delta AC is equal to summation of all the numbers in this column which equals Minus 1.27 millimeters. So minus are going in the opposite direction to what we presumed. And we get then the flexibility coefficient FAC AC from the summation of this far right column now is equal to 0 0.138. So with these values calculated, we can finally return to our compatibility equation and rearrange it in terms of the unknown force FAC. So 
from compatibility and just rearranging it we get F A C is equal to minus delta A C divided by the flexibility coefficient F A C F A C and so we get F A C was equal to 1.27 divided by 0.138 which gets us that the force was equal to 9.2 kilonewtons and that would be in tension because we presumed it to be in that direction. So at this point, we've calculated the unknown force FAC. In real problems, we need to remind ourselves that we split our real problem into... So we have the real problem, let's quickly scratch it. So we have the cross bracing. We have the pin support the roller support, a vertical roller, and we had a load of seven kilonewtons. From our approximate compatibility equation now, what we found is simply this force here, FAC, and we found that that, and here FAC, and we found that that was simply equal to 9.2. We found other forces in the process in our redundant, in our primary structure. So we had the same boundary conditions, the roller and the pin support, and we had the seven kilonewtons applied load. And we calculated forces, so this was a, this was B. So, for instance, we calculated a force NAB in this system here. However, this NAB is not, and I'll draw it a different colour, so we have A and B. So this is the real, and this is the primary. And the force NAB that we've thus far calculated is not the force NAB in the real system. This is the force that would occur in the primary system only. So if you wanted to calculate the real force NAB as well, what you'd need to do is redo your analyses there's our pin support, our roller support, and in this analysis, we would have all of the bars in the system. We have the real applied load, seven kilonewtons, and we had a force, so we had joint A, joint C, D, and B. And we now have a member AC, and we need to put this member AC back into the system to calculate the real loads in the system. So we would have to put our load FAC back in, do our member of joints on this system highlighted to now be able to calculate the real member forces NAB, NCB, NCD, and NAD, and NBD. So the forces you calculate in your primary structure are not the forces in your real structure, and you need to go and do method of joints for a third time. So let's just write that for all. Member forces 
So redo method of joints with the now known redundant member force. And at this moment in time, you can kind of see the problem that we have to deal with when we use this force-based method, the unit load method, to calculate indeterminate structures. We've had one, one level of indeterminacy, the unknown redundant force, FAC. And to be able to calculate that force, we've had to calculate the forces in the system with the unit load. We had to calculate forces in the system in the primary system when we had the seven kilonewton loads and we have to re-equilibrate the structure for a third time let's call them n dash to be able to get all of the other forces in the system so three times method of joints to be able to calculate it and this becomes very expensive very inefficient and also very error prone